Excellent. Hi, good morning, buenos dias. Uh, my name is Sergio Morales, and I'm the board president of the California School-Based Health Alliance. I'm really excited to welcome you today to our organization's statewide conference. If you are new to the California School-Based Health Alliance, or CSHA, as we call it, I am pleased you are joining us. Um, CSHA is a statewide alliance that advocates for increased access to health care for California's children and adolescents through schools. Uh, we provide technical assistance and guidance starting uh, for starting and expanding school-based health centers. Um, and our annual, our annual conference is our biggest event. So welcome, and we're really excited to have you here again. Um, this is our second conference uh, that we're doing virtually. And, uh, you know, we listened to your feedback from last year and made changes. Uh, we shortened workshops uh, in this virtual space and prioritized topics that you told us were important. Um, we heard that you loved brain breaks, so we brought them back and with even more activities uh, like uh, yoga and Zumba and storytelling. And we also invited uh, Lance McGee back uh, to be our wellness MC. The past 18 months have really tested the resilience of our children and youth and schools and communities more than ever, and we're seeing it every day. Um, the American Association of Pediatricians, uh, the American Academy of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry, and the Children's Hospital Association just declared a national emergency in children's health, mental health, uh, citing the serious toll of the COVID-19 pandemic on top of existing challenges. Some of the numbers uh, that highlight the crisis include the following, um, a 58% decrease in visits to pediatricians, a 25% increase in suicidal thinking and behavior, an increase in more than five months delay in learning that occurred at the end of the most recent school year. And as many of you would not be surprised to hear that students from historically marginalized and under-resourced communities experience the greatest declines. This is why we need uh, more school-based health centers than ever to really address the disparities, disparities that show up in young people's uh, health and education. Not only do school-based health centers increase access to health services and reduce health-related barriers to learning, but they can also help build and celebrate the resilience of young people and their communities. You know, uh, there are many bridges that school-based health centers can help build uh, between health and education, uh, from risk to resilience and connecting schools and communities. Before we thank our conference partners and sponsors, we really want to thank you for hosting uh, COVID vaccination clinics, organizing food delivery, delivering Wi-Fi hotspots, and checking in with students who were missing from class, for helping kids get caught up on physical exams, immunization, dental care, dental care and sexual health care, um, for providing desperately needed mental health services from crisis intervention to moral support and long-term counseling for students and their families. And also for all the PPE and Zoom fatigue and the concern you carry. And most importantly, for never losing sight of why you do this work. To support children and youth to be their best, healthiest, and most resilient selves. You all deserve a monumental applause for all you did to build the bridges to the heroic daily work for providing care for students and their communities. Thank you. Um, now, uh, we really want to thank uh, Rao West and Westad for co-hosting this conference with us and for helping us bring so many attendees from the Central Valley, a region that has embraced the school-based health model. I also want to take a moment to thank our sponsors who have made this event possible um, despite all the obstacles of this past year. I especially want to thank our platinum sponsors 
Kaiser Permanente and Anthem Blue Cross. Um, Kaiser and Anthem Blue Cross have made a huge uh, commitment to our organization's events, and we are truly grateful. We're also very pleased to announce that Anthem Blue Cross will be the uh, presenting sponsor at our 2022 hybrid in-person conference in San Bernardino. Thank you to our silver sponsors, uh, the California Healthcare Foundation and Blue Shield. Also would like to thank our bronze sponsors, um, Valley Children's Hospital, Inland Empire Health Plan, the Los Angeles Trust for Children's Health, the LA Care Health Plan, the California Wellness Foundation, and the California Children's Trust. We are so grateful for your generous support and uh, grateful that you are prioritizing school health. Please show our amazing sponsors and exhibitors um, some love by clicking on the exhibitors tab and visiting their, uh, their spaces and uh, you will get chances to win great prizes for doing it. Each day of the conference, um, you can win points by participating in various activities. Um, each activity will give you a code that you can turn into points uh, under the gamification tab uh, on the left-hand menu. Um, activities with points will include um, visiting our exhibitors, completing an evaluation after each day, uh, going to brain breaks, and then attending each morning's welcome and keynote. To get you started, uh, the code for today's uh, welcome is welcome. Uh, so please make sure you write it down and use it to claim your points uh, for later today. Buy raffle tickets with your points to be entered into win really great prizes. Um, at 4 p.m. today, we will be drawing the first round of winners for a $50 a caviar gift card, a $75 Target gift card, and 12 class pass for uh, dance classes with um, our dance floor. We will draw more winners for prizes at 4 p.m. tomorrow and then again on Friday. So again, uh, just to remind folks, uh, get a code for participating in conference activities, use the code to get points, buy raffle tickets with your points, and the raffle tickets you buy will give you a chance to win great prizes. We'd like to uh, remind folks that uh, self-care is important. Uh, you work hard and you're here to learn so uh, you can better serve young people working across the state, but your self-care is important to us. We have brain breaks planned throughout the conference. Um, these are fun, facilitated activities. You can uh, join to give your brain a little rest, um, which uh, the brain breaks include yoga, some dancing, some Zumba, storytelling, and tapping. Looking forward to that one. Um, also, please come back and join us uh, later this afternoon for a mindful closing. Lance McGee is a wellness coach, excuse me, a wellness consultant with the East Bay Agency for Children in his role at Frick Middle School. Uh, Lance operates the wellness room that's a sanctuary for students. Lance's presence and mindful moments were such a treat last year and we're thrilled that he is returning this year. Uh, Lance will be starting and uh, closing out each day for the rest of the conference to help us all um, enter and leave uh, this conference uh, really feeling grounded. And with that, um, I'm uh, really excited to introduce our first keynote speaker, uh, Dr. Sean Jen Wright. Uh, is Professor of Education in the Africana Studies Department and a Senior uh, Research Associate at San Francisco State University. His research examines the ways in which uh, youth in urban communities navigate the constraints of poverty and struggle to create equality and justice in their schools and communities. He is a leading innovator, provocateur, and thought leader on African-American youth, youth activism, and youth development. He is a leader in the field uh, supporting students by using healing-centered engagement and shifting systems to center hope and restoration. 
Um, that sounds so great and exciting and refreshing in these days, right? Um, there will be time afterwards uh, to, uh, after Dr. Uh, Jen Wright speaks, uh, for some Q&A. So feel free to type in your questions and we'll hold time for them at the end. So uh, I know I'm really looking forward to hearing his, his conversation, his platica. So um, please join me in welcoming uh, Dr. Sean uh, Jen Wright. Floor is yours, my brother. Thank you, Sergio. Can you can everybody hear me? Okay. Uh, okay, great. I think that there may be some tech issues with feedback. Um, so if that is the case, if the technology person can kind of um, see, give folks some recommendations about yes uh, how to address the feedback. Um, I'll, yes, I'll Dr. Jim. Yes, um, if you are able to refresh your browser or um, the play button, press the play button. That seems to be working for people. Um, so if you're able to refresh your browser or press the play button, see if that refresh the entire page, people are um, chatting that in and see if that um, helps. Thank you, Dr. Jenry. Great. Uh, tech person, can you see my screen? Is it shared? Uh, I'm just seeing you right now. Now okay. I'm seeing your screen. Yes, you're sharing. Okay, I'm, I am sure. sharing. Okay. All right. So great. Thank you, everyone. And it is an honor and pleasure to be here. Uh, it's actually, I feel like it's home. I've spoken at the National um, School Based Health Alliance, but it's it's a pleasure to see folks here from Placer County. What's up, Nancy Monroe from San Bernardino City? What's up, Tammy? I'm actually from Riverside, Bellflower, Kern County, Visalia. Merced, uh, there's folks from all over the state here. It's so good that um, that everyone is here to really uh, deepen and understand and support our young people uh, through school based school based health, which is perhaps more important and significant in the well being of our young people and families now than ever. The innovation of school based health and providing those services and supports to young people. Um, as Sergio has already articulated, uh, is perhaps uh, the most critical intervention and supports that young people and their families need at this particular time. We cannot get to learning without supporting the well being of young people, as well as the well being of the teaching and education workforce in this period. Um, I'm pleased to be able to share with you some ideas about um, what it means to heal and how our schools and how our uh, supports to young people can support uh, the healing and well-being and restoration of young people by really uh, fostering and cultivating um, hope, which is more important now uh, than ever. Um, I want to, um, I want to, um, a, a tech person, I'm sorry, but I don't know if my screen is being shared. Uh, so can you see um, the green, the woman on there with uh, with her hands folded? Uh, yes, I think you seem to be frozen though. So I'm not seeing her, I'm still seeing your slide. Okay, all right, so let me try I'm that again. I'm still seeing your title slide. Yeah, that shouldn't be the case. So let me try that again. Okay, how about now? That's great. Yes. I can okay, see. all right. All right. Tech issues, everybody. Um, I want to start today's talk with uh, a story that uh, helped me think about healing uh, and what healing means for our, our young people. And it comes from an odd place. Um, this story um, started in a prison, actually. Uh, about seven years ago, I was asked to come to a prison here in Northern California. Uh, the email that I received said something like this, Dr. Jen Wright, there are 10 men here in the prison that have read um, and that are reading your book on black youth in Oakland. And the reading group would love for you to come and talk about how you approached and, and uh, researched the book. And so I decided whether or not I was gonna go out to the prison, but I decided to go um, one Saturday uh, morning uh, I went out to the prison, and as I got to the prison, uh, to the gate, uh, the correctional officer said, Dr. Jenright, we're so glad you're here. 
uh, the 10 men are waiting for you in the cafeteria. It's a little hard to get to the cafeteria, so you have to follow the instructions so that um, you could find your way to through the maze and to the cafeteria. So when I got to the prison and I got the instructions, uh, the, the first correctional officer said, um, I know you're going to the, to the cafeteria. There are colored lines on the floor. Just find the red line, Dr. Jenright, and follow that red line all the way to the end of the, the hallway, to the corridor. There were a bunch of lines on the floor, so I looked down, I found the red line, and I followed it all the way to the end of the corridor where I was met with a door, and that door buzzed open. And I walked through it, and it shut behind me. Boom. There was another correctional officer there. That correctional officer was, hey, Dr. Jenright, I know you're going to the cafeteria. You know, uh, just follow this blue line all the way to the end of the hallway and you'll uh, be you'll be at the next door. And so I found the blue line and I followed it all the way to the end of the hallway. That door buzzed open. And then I walked through it. Boom. And then it shut behind me. And guess what? There was another correctional officer there. She said, Dr. Jenright, you're almost at the cafeteria. I know that's where you're going. Just follow this green line all the way around to the right, and you'll be right near the cafeteria. So I followed this green line all the way to the right at the end of a long hallway. And that door, when I got to the end, that door uh, buzzed open. And I walked through it. Bzz, boom. And it shut behind me. Now, I don't know if you've ever been to a prison or a jail or a place of incarceration, but when that third door shut, I became deeply sensitive and I began to feel insecure and I began to feel trapped um, as if that I, that I couldn't escape. And that third door shut, shut, something shifted inside of me. I began to imagine that I was about to go talk to these men about some research and what could I say to these men that could have an impact on these life, on their lives. And so they must be feeling this sense of incarceration, this sense of being captured and closed every single day. What could I possibly say to them? And so I became deeply insecure. Like I didn't want to just talk to them about my research. So I immediately decided that I wasn't going to give the canned speech that I normally give about research. And I decided that I, I began to imagine that those men I was about to talk to that were waiting for me in the cafeteria, that they couldn't hug their children every day. They couldn't feel the warm sun on their face. They couldn't smell uh, what it smells like after a fresh rain. And when I began to imagine how they feel every day, I became more and more insecure about what I was going to say to them. And so as I got to the cafeteria, uh, there were two double doors, and the double doors flung open. And to my surprise, I was shocked at what I saw. I thought there was going to be 10 men waiting for me, and instead, it was about 250 men, all excited to see me in their orange jumpsuits. And they came up to me one by one. Hey, Dr. Jenright, we're glad you're here. The first um, uh, young man, um, his name was Chris. Chris came up to me and said, Dr. Jenright, I'm glad you're here. Hey, man, I've been in here since 1987. My heart sank. And another brother came up to me. His name was Greg. Hey, Dr. G, we're glad you're here. I've been in here since 1989, man. And one by one, they came up to me and gave me their name and the year they had entered that prison. And each time they did, my heart sank and my humanity grew. And I didn't know what to say to these men and so as they ushered me up to stay up to the stage to talk to them about my research, the 250 men in the cafeteria, I didn't have a speech. I didn't know what to say. And so I did what the only thing I knew how to do, and that was speak from my heart. I spoke to them about some of the challenges I was experiencing raising a six foot three son at the time he was 16 here in Oakland, California, because I had feared for his safety from the police. I, and I shared with them my concerns and my challenges of raising, uh, of, of, of having to care for my, my aging parents. And I just talked from my heart, you know, for, for about 45 minutes. But one thing I did say to the group is that 
whatever brought you here, there's always a possibility of you healing. You can heal yourself and you can heal those you may have harmed. And no matter you are no, no matter what you did, you are not the worst thing you've ever done. And there's always a possibility of healing. And I went on and talked a little bit more and my time was up and they ushered me off the stage. And there's this big loud buzz that told the prisoners, the, uh, the incarcerated men uh, to go back to their cells. And so as I was leaving the cafeteria, after I had given my heartfelt speech about my life, I heard this booming voice behind me, hey, Dr. G. And so I turned around and there was a tall brother there. And he said, hey, man, I just want to let you know that I really appreciated the words you shared, man. And, I'm, and I said, I'm glad whatever I shared had, you know, you know, helped you out. He said, no, I need you to understand, man. It's hard living in a place like this. It's, t it's tough, man. People always challenge me because I'm so tall and big. They think I'm mean. They think I'm a, you know, I'm a threat, but I'm really just a teddy bear. A couple months ago, man, I got in a fight and it cut me across my face and he had a scar on his face. And I'm like, I'm so sorry, man, that you got in a fight. And he said, you know what, man, it's tough living in a place like this, but there's something that you said that, that, that touched me, man. It, it, it mattered to me. And I said, well, what is it? He said, well, you said we can always heal. And there's something that I do that I use to heal every single day. And I asked him, well, what is it that you do? And he said, he, he reached into his pocket and he opened up, uh, pulled out this little bottle and he opened up the bottle and then he blew bubbles. And the bubbles floated over my head. And my first thought was, did this tall brother just blow bubbles in my face in prison? Now, I know that I can't hear you laugh, but you're supposed to be laughing right now. But that, that was my first thought. And as the bubbles floated over my head, as he blew bubbles, he said, yeah, man, I blow bubbles because it heals me. It makes it possible for me to live in a difficult place like this. It reminds me when I was a child, my daddy used to take me to the park. He used to put me on the swing and we would blow bubbles. And so I blow these bubbles to remind myself that I'm good. And I blow these bubbles to remind myself that I can heal. And every time I do it, man, it just makes it easier for me to be in a difficult place like this. And as I left that prison that day, thinking about his bubble stories, I became really curious about my own bubble stories. What do I do daily to make it possible for me to live in a difficult and challenging situation? And I became deeply curious about your bubble stories and what kinds of practices do we use in our personal lives and in our professional lives to cultivate a sense of well-being and healing? What are your bubble stories? What are the bubble stories that you use daily or that we provide for our young people and their families to deal with the challenges of the context that we're in today? I think that when I became really curious about bubble stories, I began to think more and more about the role of healing and, and the ways in which it can, it can provide uh, spaces for us to restore ourselves and, the, and our young people uh, and their families. But first, when he said living in a difficult context or difficult situation like this, it made me want to understand, well, what is the context in which we are healing from? What is the context that our young people are healing from? We recognize that we know that we are a society right now, that every one of you in the schools, that our society is sitting between two things. It's sitting between trauma on one hand and trans transformation on the other. We know the trauma from what we saw and witnessed with Mr. Floyd. We know that unfortunately there are continuous and ongoing uh, uh, um, instances of gun violence, there's stress, in, in the workforce and the teaching workforce and nurses and schools. We also recognize, however, that while we sit next to trauma, we also sit right next to transformation. We see what's happening with the movements for black dignity and the movements for humanizing a a API communities. And we see calls for 
uh, greater forms or new innovative forms of public safety. All of these things are happening at the same time. And as a society, we sit right between both. And this means that our role is is uh, nurses, our role as social workers, our role as youth development professionals and teachers is to recognize that if we don't change our practices to be more bubble story-like, that we will be, we will be uh, uh, moving our society more into transformation. But if we clench and understand and use healing, that we can move our society into transformation rather than trauma. So, we know and we recognize that the that as Sergio has already mentioned that racialized trauma has uh, as a result of COVID has shown that um, that communities of color have been disproportionately impacted by uh, disproportionate impact to from the COVID virus. We see in a recent study that was released by Teachers College that Black children experience even greater harm uh, from their exposure to trauma. They experience greater amounts of, of uncertainty and fear and stress, which complicates and makes returning back to school even more and more challenging. We also recognize that 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 uh, there is ongoing um, ongoing um, uh, exposure to trauma, recognizing that sometimes the schools, sometimes youth development programs don't have the entire bandwidth to support the mental health needs of young people and their families in those in these schools. But it's not just young people, right? The New York Times in March um, uh, of this year um, uh, has um, shown that we've all had some traumatic experience as a result of COVID in America, regardless of our race, class, or gender, that COVID has had an indelible traumatic experience for many of us. So when we think about the context of trauma, that we have to think about it in a much broader perspective. I was taught about thinking about trauma through what's called the medical model. And that is, I was trained to see trauma largely through mental health, mental health and behavioral health risks. I was trained to see uh, and treat and respond to depression, anxiety, compulsive behavior and so forth. Uh, or violence or substance abuse. These are behavioral and mental health risks that see trauma as um, a response or a reaction to an episodic form of, of, of trauma. That is, an individual may experience a form of trauma, and as a result of that ep episodic exposure, we produce these mental and behavioral health risks. In response to that, I was trained to provide therapy or treatment or counseling or health education all of which are important, but the challenge with the, met, the medical model con, context of understanding trauma is that it doesn't take into account more upstream causes of trauma. Social inequalities such as racial bias, class, sexual orientation, and immigrant status are institutional or social inequalities that produce disproportionate amounts of trauma. This is why we see black and brown communities having disproportionate exposure to trauma. We also see that institutional inequalities, such as governments and schools and nonprofit organizations, sometimes reproduce trauma. Just think about the traumatic experience of those children and their families that were held and are still being held on the border in Texas and in San Diego, California. That amount of trauma will be multi generational as a result of our government response and our government actions that created uh, that intergenerational trauma for. Uh, for um, um, migrants that are coming to America. And lastly, living conditions. We see that living conditions, uh, we see that with COVID also exacerbate exposure to trauma. So we use a broader perspective to think about the causes of trauma, not just occurring as an episodic act, but a social ecological model that says we have to take in consideration the ways in which the environment itself produces an, a, a disproportionate amounts of trauma. Now, you may be familiar with the term post-traumatic stress disorder. It's a term that is used to describe what happens to soldiers after they leave the field, after they leave um, the battlefield, and they have, this, they have disruptions in their behavioral and mental health. In a, cl in a class that I was teaching with my graduate students at San Francisco State University, uh, they began to sort of, we began to talk about the challenges with post-traumatic stress disorder. And one of my graduate students said that there's nothing post 
about the trauma that the uh, the trauma that he's experienced by young people that he was working with, that there was a persistentness of trauma. And so in class, they began to talk about the second challenge with post-traumatic stress disorder is that it locates the disease or it locates the issue within the individual as calling it a disorder without looking at the broader environment which produces and engenders um, uh, traumatic experiences. And so the term persistent traumatic stress environment more accurately describes the- Dr. Jenry, I apologize for cutting in. Can we just pause for, um, let's pause for about 15 seconds. People are really having difficulty with the presentation. With, and so I'm just thinking if we just pause. Um, okay, you wanna tell me when to start? I will, okay. one moment. And for everyone who's watching, I apologize for all of these interruptions. We're trying to troubleshoot why the connection and sound are um, not working for so many of you. So we apologize for this. Do you want me to go back? Yes, Dr. Jinray, um, you can go back um, maybe, um, maybe one minute back. And then why don't you begin again? I apologize. Okay, I'll just wait for you to tell me when to start. Please start now. So what we have then is another view of the root causes of trauma, which is from the social ecological model. And this suggests that we have to take in consideration Racial, social inequalities such as racial bias, sexual orientation, immigrant status. But we also have to consider institutional inequality. That is the ways in which our government and our schools and our nonprofit organizations and corporations produce trauma. trauma. Just think of what happened with those children and their families um, that were migrating to the United States from uh, South America and Mexico. Right, the, the, the government's policy to remove children from their families will cause and create intergenerational forms of trauma. But we also have to think about living conditions. Those li living conditions as we saw and continue to see as a result of COVID uh, produced uh, disproportionate amounts of trauma as a result of um, housing inequality, access to healthcare and quality, uh, quality um, um, uh, having access to jobs. So all of these things taken together, the social ecological model gives us a broader perspective on how we can begin to think about the root causes of what creates trauma in the first place. So many of us are familiar with the term post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, and I was uh, explaining this concept in my class, post-traumatic stress disorder, when they began to sort of think, my students began to talk about two challenges with the term post-traumatic stress disorder. The first challenge they, they articulated was that there is nothing post about the experience of, of, of stress and trauma that some of the young people that they were working with. A young person can experience a traumatic event today and something else could happen in a month and something else could happen uh, um, two weeks after that. So there was a persistentness of exposure to traumatic stress that many of the young people experienced. And the second, that when it was called a disorder, uh, it located the issue in the individual as opposed to locating the issue in the environment. And that is that the disease is not simply uh, about um, mental and behavioral risks, it's about the conditions that produced mental and behavioral risk in the first place. And so we began to use the term persistent traumatic stress environment. And when we use persistent traumatic stress environment, it clues us in that the environments are, there's a persistentness of stress, but that we remove the disease, the disease from the individual and have a broader perspective of understanding how the environment itself produces uh, traumatic experiences. Now, James Gabarino in a book called Raising Children in a Socially Toxic Environment says that when we are in and young people experience persistent stress, it produces social toxicity. And social toxins, he argues, are like physical toxins. If you think for, for a minute that 
if you lived in a room, hopefully you could see this. Um, if you could see this room, that there are um, asbestos and lead paint peeling off the wall. If you lived and worked in an environment like this, eventually your exposure to those physical toxins could be uh, could make you sick. And if you're not healed from your exposure to the physical toxins, those physical toxins could actually be lethal. But James Gabarino says that there are social equivalents to physical toxins. Um, and he calls them social toxins or social toxicity. And social toxicity are things like fear, uncertainty, shame, dis, uh, uh, distrust. All of these things exist in our environments but oftentimes go undiagnosed. And as a result of young people's exposure to social toxicity, most many of the times in our schools, we read and examine and respond to exposure to social toxicity with one tool, discipline. Which means that if we use, if we respond to social exposure to social toxicity with discipline, we might actually be reproducing the trauma rather than healing young people from it. So this is a way that we can understand and better sort of conceptualize how to social toxicity has an impact on all of us in our work with young people. We like to call this, um, uh, we, we like to call her Mia. And Mia works and lives in a socially toxic environment, let's say. And um, Mia wants to support young people. She's a social worker, she's a teacher. But as she, if she works in a socially toxic environment, Social toxins are like toxic rain clouds that are shaped by poverty and colorism and racism and patriarchy and ageism. All of these things are like socially are socially toxic. And unlike regular rain that gets Mia wet on the outside, this social toxicity gets inside of Mia and it stays there. And when it stays there, she's sometimes not aware that she's been exposed to these forms of social toxicity. And these forms of social toxicity have an impact at three levels. They have an impact at Mia at the individual level. The social toxicity has an impact on Mia at the interpersonal level, uh, but it doesn't stop there. The social toxicity also has an impact at Mia uh, where she works, the institution where she works at the institutional level. And that institution then produces values, practices, and policies that are shaped by that social toxicity, which create, the institution then creates its own form of social toxicity that goes back out into society and it reproduces itself. So what we have then is a cycle or an ecosystem of social toxicity. If we are to heal, it means that we have to heal the entire ecosystem of what is causing and creating harm. And oftentimes what we do is we respond to healing at one of these levels. In other words, we may change the policy or the practice, but we don't do anything with the relationships. Or we may focus on individual healing at the self-care level, but we haven't done anything about the interpersonal relationships or the policies and practices. This is why a healing-centered process means that we take in consideration healing at all three levels, which is what we call healing-centered engagement. And healing-centered engagement builds upon our notions of trauma-informed approaches. It doesn't abandon them. It just takes our, our understanding of trauma-informed approaches to the next level. I, I began to think about trauma uh, healing-centered approaches one night when I was um, in a community of about 10 uh, African-American young men. Some of you may have read about my experience in an article I wrote uh, called The Future of Healing, Shifting from Trauma-Informed Care to Healing-Centered Engagement. And during that meeting uh, at Laney College here in Oakland, California, we would be, we were sitting in our blue plastic chairs, and my goal was to help these young men understand that their behavioral risk was a result of them responding to fears and anxieties of something that happened to them. And so we would talk about the, their sexual abuse. We would talk about the violence that they experienced. Many of the young people were homeless and every Wednesday night we would come and recount and talk about these things that hurt, that happened to them. One night, one of the young men said, Marcus, he said, Dr. Jenright, you know, I like coming here on, on Wednesday nights, but 
I'm more than the worst thing that ever happened to me. I'm not just my trauma. And when he said that, I thought he was joking at first. He said, you know, I, I don't want to just talk about the worst thing that happened to me. I also want to talk about the fact that I want to one day open up a coffee shop. And when he said that, the other young men perked up. And they said, yeah, man, I want to talk about one day I want to open up and create my own clothing line. And another one said, yeah, I want to, you know, create my own um, my own blog and my own sort of travel, tra travel channel. And they all began to vibe and talk about their dreams. They began to riff off their collective imagination. And when I left th that healing circle or that trauma-informed circle that night, I began to reinvestigate my own training and basic assumptions around trauma-informed care to, to begin to create a response to exposure to trauma that was much more asset-based. And so this is how healing-centered engagement came about. And so healing-centered engagement is a perspective it's an approach and as well as a, a strategy that addresses harm and restores well-being. When we talk about healing-centered engagement, it's a strength-based approach. It means that we're not only focusing on the worst thing that happened, but it also takes a holistic view of, of healing and well-being. And it recenters culture and identity as a central feature in our well-being because we recognize that oftentimes some of the first harm comes from um, attacks or assaults on our identities, our racial identities, our gendered identities, our sexual identities, our class identities, our immigrant status. And so healing-centered engagement begins with an interrogation and a restoration of our identities as a strategy to become more holistic in thinking about our, our healing and well-being. So if we think about some of the distinctions between trauma-informed approaches and healing-centered approaches, here are a few. Healing-centered, uh, uh, trauma-informed care may begin or ask the question, what happened to you? Where trauma, where healing-centered approaches ask, what's right with you? A trauma-informed approach may focus on episodic harm to the individual, where a healing-centered approach focuses on holistic healing at all of the three levels that I talked about, healing at the individual, the interpersonal, as well as the institutional level. And it views harm not as episodic, but an ongoing um, uh, in the content, in an ecosystem of harm and social toxicity. Trauma-informed care may use as a clinical approach that tries to respond and support the individual, where healing-centered engagement uses a collective approach that sees healing as a collective response. So when we when we think about this, um, healing-centered engagement is a, is based in our indigeneity. It's based in um, our indigenous and our African roots that say that. If I'm sick, we are sick. Or if I'm well, we are well. And it's a departure from our European, our Eurocentric notions of what constitutes well-being, the belief that an individual can be well and the community from which he or she or they belong to can be sick, right? And so healing-centered engagement says that there has to be a collective response to healing and well-being, not just an individual one. And lastly, trauma-informed care generally focuses on treating clients, youth, families, and so forth, where healing-centered engagement provides, um, uh, provide, provide, su provide supports to providers around their own healing and well-being, as well as children and young people and their families. Now, this last point is particularly important because healing-centered engagement supports um, adult providers with their own healing and well-being. This means that oftentimes when we think about our roles as social workers, as nurses, um, as therapists, there's a tendency for our own training to focus on the well-being of children, youth, and their families. But we haven't considered much about supporting the well-being of the adult provider. This means that schools, school districts have to think about the ecosystem or the systems of institutional support to provide well-being, not just sick days, right? Uh, for the adult providers. Healing-centered engagement says that in order to create well-being, you have to have well-being both with the provider as well as the young person. So how do we integrate healing-centered engagement into your, the work that you do with children, youth, and their families? The first is an understanding that, that healing happens at these three levels. It happens at the individual level, the interpersonal level, and at the institutional level. 
Uh, we use pr these five principles that I'm going to share with you quickly. I want to make sure there's time for question and uh, question and answers. But these are five principles that we use to um, talk about and engage and implement healing centered engagement. And we call these the karma principles. Karma stands for culture, agency, relationships, meaning and aspirations. And each of these principles are based in two things. One, they're based in empirical evidence based research, but they're also based in 25 years of deep engagement and sweat and tears and uh, on the ground work with children, youth and families in my own work and research. So we bring these five principles together. And when we use these five principles, we cultivate uh, culture, we cultivate agency, we cultivate relationships, meaning and aspirations. We begin to create a healing ecosystem for young people and their families to thrive and flourish. I'll go over each of these relatively quickly because I want to make sure we have time. Like I said, the first is culture, which is really culture and identity. And this is developing an awareness of one's own and other racial and other social identities. This means that we have ongoing engagement and conversations about race, about class, about our own social identity. It means that we actually are engaging healthy and conversations about who we are and why it matters. It means that you might talk about your own identity. Oftentimes, um, I, I, when we do our trainings, these are questions about what does it mean to be white? Or what does it mean to be a woman? What does it mean to be white working with families of color? What does it mean to be a woman and working with young men? Um, it means that we're asking questions about our own identities and we're supporting our, our clients and young people with, this, with the restoration of their own identities. At agency is really our the, the capacity and ability to respond to change. This is uh, based in our understanding of, of, of this is based in research that that says and suggests that well-being when we have higher levels of agency this notion that i can actually create the outcomes that i want in my life we have higher levels of agency it produces and creates a greater sense of well-being agency means that we are cultivating the capacity for young people to, to engage in political education when young people have a broader understanding of the conditions that shape their their lives, their neighborhoods, their schools, when they're engaging in civic activities, when they're able to begin to cultivate a broader understanding of their life and then respond to it, they're creating a sense of well-being. This is why when we saw and experienced the trauma of what happened with Mr. Floyd, we saw the world, we saw every city respond to that incident with a sense of agency, with marching, with protest, because that collective engagement, when I'm doing something with someone collectively, it cr creates a sense of belonging and a, a sense of direction that facilitates agency and well being in the lives and collective well being uh, for individuals um, in, the, in their communities. The third is relationships. There's always two types of relationships transactional relationships and transformative relationships. Transactional relationships are those relationships that are a function of our titles. I'm the principal, you are the, you are the teacher. Um, you are the student, I am the teacher. Transactional relationships are relationships that are efficient, but not enough for healing. So we need transformative relationships. And those are relationships that are a function of our humanity. When we can uh, be vulnerable, when we cultivate empathy, these are ways that we begin to create transformative relationships. And we all have transformative relationships in our lives. The next is meaning. And meaning is an ongoing reminder of why we're engaged in this work, as Sergio has already mentioned, that sometimes the, the focus on billing and the focus on numbers, on all of the kind of mechanisms and technical ways of thinking about our work, sometimes it gets in the way of reminding ourselves that it's important. But it's also important that we support meaning with our with our young people and their families. This is asking them questions and supporting them about why it's why their lives are important, where their lives are going. This is important about what is it they want to do. So meaning is an important strategy in cultivating a sense of well-being. And lastly, aspirations. And last aspirations is built and based in hope theory by Snyder's work, as well as built in the the practice that I learned in that trauma-informed circle that I gave, that I was uh, hosting at Laney College. And that is 
when we have and cultivate future goal orientation, when young people could see themselves in the future, that could, contributes to a sense of well-being. It doesn't mean that they don't have to ever talk about the worst thing that happened to them, but it means that we also cultivate the ability for young people to have future goal orientation. The research suggests that when we cultivate future goal orientation, young people can see themselves in the future, they begin to in, uh, and lean into their imagination and their dreams, and we create opportunities and pathways for that to make that possible, that contributes to a profound sense of well-being with for young people. And so the karma principles, culture, agency, relationships, meaning, and aspirations are the principles that we use to drive a healing-centered strategy into our work uh, with young people and their families. Um, I'm going to give one quick example, and then I'll hopefully I'll have time for some questions. Um, if I'm over time, just please stop me, and then I'll I'll shut up. Okay. Um, so, uh, quick example of this is an example of relationships, um, and there are always two kinds of relationships, as I said, transactional relationships and transformative relationships. And so, um, transactional relationships, as I said, are defined by role, position, authority where transformative relationships are based in trust, empathy, uh, transparency, vulnerability. This is uh, an example of how a city began to reduce crime by young people by cultivating empathy and love relationships with young people who carry guns. This is a, this is a map of North Richmond here in the San Francisco Bay Area that in um, uh, 2000, and the early 2000s had the highest homicide rate in California per capita. And the, and the city responded by continuing to hire police officers. But hiring more police officers didn't reduce the, 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 the homicide rate, the, uh, the, the gun violence rate. And so uh, a brilliant uh, young man named Devon Bogan created, uh, came with an idea that if they hired credible messengers, these are formerly incarcerated, some of them were formerly incarcerated, older men that really understood and knew the community and created loving, caring, deep relationships with young men that carry guns, they could change the outcomes of gun violence in that community. And so that's, that's exactly what they did. They created the Office of Neighborhood Safety. And if you wanna look really quickly at some of the values of the Office of Neighborhood Safety, um, the power of love and listening can turn lives around. The relationship is the intervention and the intervention is the relationship. They train older men, young men, um, I'm sorry, not older young men, but older men, uh, they train them to create loving, caring, empathetic relationships with young men who carry guns. And that's exactly what they did. They hired these men and they would walk on the streets and they would talk to these other men. And they, as I uh, followed and shadowed them, uh, they would say things like, hey, you know what? I know uh, you, you want your, 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 your mama needs some groceries. I'm going to go get some groceries for your mama. Or you know what? I know your little brother needs some cleats for football. I got some in the trunk. And uh, in essence, they began to cultivate these relationships that were like they, they became like their uncle or their surrogate fathers. And over time, uh, they were trained to say two, th two things to these young men after every interaction. Um, I want you to be alive and free. And you know I love you, right? They're trained to say that. Now I know that sounds weird, but after time, after time, over time, the young men began to believe and have the relationship with the uh, older men that were trained by the Office of Neighborhood Safety. This is a picture of Joe. Joe's with the Richmond Office of Neighborhood Safety, and he said, "You know, we say I love you, dude. I really mean I don't want you anything to happen to you." And he said, they see me as Uncle Joe. And every conversation um, we have ends with, hey, man, you know, I love you. I want you to be alive and free. Now, at first, the young men didn't really respond to that. But over time, they began to build trust uh, and, and empathy and develop close relationships with these young men. So much so that the, the uh, Joe and the Office of Neighborhood Safety never told them not to carry guns. They just said, if you carry guns, come see me first. If you need to go shoot come see me first. And so unfortunately, the young men that they were building relationships wanted to go shoot up a party. And they decided they were going to shoot up the party, but they went to go see Joe first, as he said. 
So they went to see Joe and Joe was like, hey, I know you need to shoot up the party, but um, just hold on one second. Let's go get some food first. I know that sounds weird, but instead of shooting up the party, he took them to go get some food and he was able to de-escalate uh, de de -escalate what they were going to do. Because after all, they're only 14, 15 year old uh, boys that carry guns. And year after year, day after day, month after month, um, when you have these kind of interactions with these young men, this is the kind of results you can have. In 2009, there were 45 homicides. And uh, when, when they did not have the Office of Neighborhood Safety, in 2010, it was reduced. To, in 2014, those relationships, those transformed relationships, uh, created um, an outcome of only 12 homicides. And today, it's probably even lower. And so this is an example of the power of transformative relationships and how these relationships can have an impact. But it's not just an impact on neighborhoods. The Surgeon General of California talks about the power of tra uh, transformative relationships on our, um, on, our, uh, on our actual nervous system, and that it has an impact on our, on our ability to produce oxytocin. Um, it has an ability uh, in epigenetics, which means it can actually restore and, re and create the kind of neurological responses that produce and facilitate well-being. And so when we talk about healing-centered engagement, this is a holistic approach that allows us to actually create the kind of environments that allow for young people to facilitate healing in our schools and well-being. If you want to learn more, just go ahead and email us at Flourish Agenda at info at flourishagenda.com. We'd be happy to send you more information about healing-centered engagement. Uh, and enroll in our Healing Centered Engagement Certification if you have interest in learning more about our Healing Centered process and practice. All right, thanks so much. I think I have some time for some questions. Dr. Jenray, yes, and before Sergio, before you um, take it over, I want to apologize to everybody for all of these technical issues that we've been having. And there are some, um, some recommendations in the chat for um, for what's working for some people, um, which is um, sorry about having it. It's to um, it's to refresh your browser, click on the standalone player under the screen to open another window, and then close your original browser window. So I apologize for all of this. Um, Sergio, I'm going to hand it over to you. Great. Thank you, Marcel. And I also just want to recognize, you know, people's resiliency and just doing your own, you know, finding your own bubbles in our, as we're problem solving, right, during Dr. Jin Wright's um, uh, Platica, his conversation today. And again, just rest assured, slides will be available and uh, the recording will be available of this really uh, fascinating conversation today. So thank you, Dr. Jin Rai, um, for uh, sharing your experiences of, of the work and your perspective. And one of the things that, you know, I, I'm definitely walking away with, um, you know, I love that the, the allegory, the, the image of bubbles, right? And one of the things that uh, bubbled up for me, what I wanna ask you about is, what are some of the most uh, surprising bubble stories that you've heard from um, your research or communities or from audiences like this? Yeah, great question. You know, I think I think many of us have bubble stories. We just don't tell them. Or sometimes um, we we um, we use bubble stories, but we don't see them as really an important strategy for for well being. Um, you know, I I've I've seen. Um, no, you know, I've seen people have um, uh, do all kinds of things from, you know, from exercise and yoga. Uh, I've seen people um, uh, take, uh, create their own healing centered uh, sort of um, support groups in schools. And so these are groups of about five to seven people that they just meet on Thursday evenings out, off the, off a of school site um, to talk about their dreams or to talk about things that are happening in their lives to build that kind of support group. Um, I've seen people go away on retreats, right? Where just being away in the woods and, and, and having the opportunity for people to, to build those kind of powerful relationships. But I think most importantly in my own work, um, when I see the, the bubble stories is, is when young people are taken out of sometimes the, the toxic environment of the neighborhood or the school 
and they for the first time can see a deer or a tree or a pine cone uh, or and smell the ocean or smell the forest um, that that experience sometimes is an important bubble story that ruptures at least now young people have the awareness and understanding that there is a space uh, that's important for their own healing and restoration right I totally I'm, I'm right there with you and i've experienced that right with young people myself when i was a youth worker right and taking young people out and having them seem get all emotional and reacting to like seeing a deer in the woods right absolutely and and also for us as adults i think sometimes um we don't have schools don't always have the systems of support to support teachers with their own uh, teachers and adults in the space with their own well-being and oftentimes it's just you know take a sick day but that is a deficit-based um sort of policy to think about well-being or a wellness day right um but i've seen school districts sort of take this idea and build sabbaticals i've take i've seen school districts take some of these and and provide um, um, CEUs, continuing education units, for teachers that go out and learn a wellness practice and bring it back to their school to in implement in their daily work. And so there's a number of ways to sort of think about the significance and importance of well-being in um, the, the production of healing-centered engagement in our, in our organizations and schools. Yeah, great. I, you know, appreciate you sharing that. I think those are some some pretty cool uh, concrete examples that I hope folks are able to think about going back to their systems and, and integrating that into their school systems or, or workplaces. Um, one of the questions um, also that has been uh, bubbling up is um, just thinking about similar in, in that sense on a structural level is you were talking about it, but can you give other examples of places that are using healing centered engagement um, strategies well? Uh, sure. <laughs> you know, uh, what are some, some key factors that need to be in place? Yeah, you know, I think a few years ago, um, there's a school district that, I, that approached me and had a real significant challenge. And the challenge was that, you know, 60 to 70% 70, 70 of their students um uh, had experienced trauma resulting from an ice raid ongoing ice raids in their neighborhood and were coming to school fearful that their parents or their tias or their their you know their uncles would not be uh there when they would go home and so the, the, the students were were stressed and they couldn't sit and learn and listen and were not focused and so the principal said when she went to the central office to provide more more support that the the, 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 the central office could only provide a therapist, I think it was once a week for a few hours, but this is for a significant number of students. And so as she took it upon herself, then they found an abandoned classroom uh, and, and, and they created what's, what I like to call is the school spa. And I wish I had, a, I do have a picture of it, but I'm not gonna put it up, but they found this a, a classroom that was just u being used for storage. Uh, they got four or five teachers they put um, 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 couches and bean bags in there. They had um, diffusers where things smelled really good. They put l low light in there and they have soft music. And it, it was like a spa. And the, the only rule to go into the room was that if you go into the room, you have to sit quietly. So the students would go in there to decompose. The, sometimes the adult staff and teachers would go in there to be silent. It was sort of the silent room. And what happened is, is that room became the epicenter of the energy of the rest of the school over time. So that now the teachers could say, okay, now it's time to pretend like we're all in, in the spa room. And from that, they began to create a practice and a culture of, of those practices began to reverberate throughout the school. And that's just one example, right? That they couldn't provide enough sort of mental health supports to the school. And so the, the principal decided to use what they had to actually facilitate the mental health for young people. Now, it didn't resolve or it didn't solve the traumatic experiences that these young people were having, but it provided just a space of opportunity for teachers and students to have different kinds of conversations about what was happening in their lives in, in the classroom. Interesting, there's another question that came up um, in the Q&A box that I wanted to get your perspective is that, you know, California was considering legislation to allow mental health as an excused absence for students. What do you think about that approach? 
Well, I mean, I think that, you know, it, you know, mental health is sometimes under, it's not considered, you know, mental health is oftentimes considered kind of ancillary health, right? That, you know, if you have physical health issues, then that's real health issues. But mental right. health is kind of like, ah, it's kind of not really health issue. And as a result of that, um, we have a stigma and, and that stigma finds itself in public policy. And so um, I think that it's not just, you know, being able to, you know, uh, you know, take an excused absence for a mental health day, but we also need wellness days. I think we need proactive legislation and policy to promote health rather than to just respond to mental health uh, uh, disease or mental health issues. So I think we need to go, go even further and allow for students to take health and wellness days, days with their, that are used to actually facilitate their own well-being and then bring that well-being back into the classroom so it doesn't have to be stigmatized. It can actually be promoted as a central feature in what we need to be doing in schools, particularly now. So I hope I answered that question, Sergio. Yeah, I mean, I'm all for wellness days, too. I think schools need to do that. I think employers should do that as well. You know, that's that's some really great, um, some really great uh, suggestions there that I appreciate. Um, you know, lastly, uh, the, the last question I have here is just wanted to get your thoughts to wrap up in terms of just do you see movement in the behavioral health field and recognizing persistent traumatic stress environment? Well, you know, it's there. There's there's certainly more movement now, as you already mentioned in uh, the AAP AAP news, that there's certainly more recognition now about the significant epidemic and pandemic of mental and, and behavioral health now, um, and that's because not just that it has an impact on young people, but it also has a, a reverberating impact on adults as well. And I think that schools are starting to recognize that in, in many ways with school districts, those schools and school districts that don't have a school based health um, um, school based health centers, that their infrastructure is thin and frail. Right. And that that there needs to be greater bandwidth to provide the kind of mental health supports to, to young people, children and their families. And that means I think we also have to broaden what we're thinking about constitutes mental health this this is not only just sort of mental health that that we, that requires you know one therapist and one-on-one -on -one therapy right we need to be thinking broader about group uh, and community responses to uh, mental and behavioral health problems and challenges but also be thinking about the ways that groups and, co and communities can um, support the well-being of, of young people one quick example um, here in the San Francisco Bay Area, um, again, a school was dealing with uh, a shooting that had occurred in the neighborhood. Um, many of the, 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 the children, um, this was a, a middle school, were really going through it one week. And uh, what the, again, the, the, the school-based health provided those supports, but what that school-based health count, uh, mental health counselor did was amazing. They uh, brought in some of the grandmamas, some of the you know, the older people into the school to hold the conversations about healing because the grandmamas had the wisdom, right? They had some of the cure, the culture, uh, the practices, uh, the song, uh, all of the things that um, become ingredients and in collective well-being. They brought them to the school and began to create that environment, those conversations uh, for the, the the young people who were who were going through it, and it's so it's responses like this that I think hold the promise for new ways of thinking about responding to behavioral and mental health. That was a long answer to your <laughs> question, <Hey>. Sergio. <laughs> it is all good, but you have a lot of wisdom to share, so that that is that is a okay. Um, I, I just really want to thank you again, Dr. Jen Wright, um, for your wisdom, for um, the work that you do to our communities to help uplift, uplift uh, the centering of, of Black men and boys and other communities of color and the work that you do to help bring uh, healing justice into our communities that's so desperately needed um, for us and for the next you know, seven generations. I, I really thank you for that. Um, 
and I, uh, you know, for moving us all towards a model of wellness and that's deeply respectful of students and in our communities. Um, to really just move our conference participants for um, the rest of our day, just really want to acknowledge that um, there has been some challenges today. Um, we believe that issues have been resolved now for the remainder of the day. Uh, so thanks to our teams from our um, uh, CSHA and um, our uh, RAL West folks who seem and West Ed folks who have uh, seem to have worked this out. If there's issues, please let us know in the comment box. Uh, just please, uh, for our participants, continue to visit exhibitors. We have our first brain break, which is Zumba with Making Wave Studio. Um, our first round of workshops starts at 1045. Don't forget to come back to uh, end of the day for a mindful closing with Lance and make sure to complete your evaluation um, after every day. Thank you very much and look forward to the rest of conference with you. Thank you. Okay.